Uh, I'm a pharmacologist and a drug discoverer. So in my career, I've spent um, most of my time discovering drugs for particularly for personalized medicine. I have uh, in the teams that I've led, I've taken about 13 drugs into clinical trials from the lab. Um, and discovered more than those because sometimes we have backup compounds which you know we you you keep in reserve. So my background is is a, is, is trained in biochemistry and pharmacology, and then I've had experience in at AstraZeneca for four years, um, in academia in Cambridge and in Glasgow, briefly in Stanford in the U.S. I've done two startup companies, so I've got experience in 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 biotech as well. And I'm really excited by team science and by multidisciplinary science, you know, working together between biologists, chemists, pharmacologists, clinicians, data scientists. Um, that's all very exciting to me. For seven years, I was chief executive of the Institute of Cancer Research. So I've had a period of focusing on leadership. That was during the COVID period as well, which is, which is very challenging. I've always been able to keep my lab active during during that period. Now I've stepped down as president and chief executive. I'm focusing completely on on my own lab. There's a couple of drug projects that I've led that I'm keen to see go through into clinical trial. And I'm helping the institute to build a biotech park on our on our Sutton campus. So all of those things keep me busy. So I think the field of drug discovery in cancer, is, it's been enormously exciting over the last probably 20 years since the human genome sequence was, was revealed. Um, and then the genomes of cancers were sequenced. And that revealed to us um, just how many genetic abnormalities there are in different types of cancer. And then we can use that information to select the targets that we want to develop drugs against. So that's been really exciting. The particular challenge is that at the moment, only 13% of all cancer patients have a particular genetic pattern that makes them suitable for treatment with a, a personalized medicine or a targeted therapy. So that means that, um, you know, 87% of, uh, of, of patients don't have a targeted therapy. It's been helped by immunotherapy because obviously with the new immune therapies, but they've predominantly been most active in melanoma and some types of cancer like certain types of lung cancer. Many patients with types of cancers that do not yet benefit from this new era of molecular medicine. And so the big challenge is to what I call extend the druggable genome. One of the reasons that there's a limitation so far is that some of the targets that are faulty in cancers, like the RAS gene, for example, or the MYC gene, um, they used to be called undruggable. In other words, it would be impossible to make a drug. What, these days, there are new technologies um, I talked about fragment-based drug discovery for um, of how we get we discovered the AKT inhibitor capivacertib, which is just under review at the FDA. I talked about phenotypic screening, where instead of going for a molecular target in the test tube, as it were, you can do your drug screening against the cells that themselves that have the molecular change. There are RAS inhibitors now where you can use what we call covalent inhibitors. These bind irreversibly to the target and allows us to target RAS, which was not possible before. And there are other new types of technologies, which we call degraders, where instead of inhibiting or blocking the function like, like a lock and key mechanism, you actually eliminate the, the, the molecule that's the problem from the cell. You degrade it, you eliminate it. Um, and so these are all opening up new avenues. Um, so I think over the next decade, we'll see 
a, a real expansion of the number of patients who can benefit from these personalized medicines. But that's the biggest challenge that we face. The second biggest challenge that we face is drug resistance. This is the ability of cancer cells to evolve in a, like a Darwinian evolution. You know, you, you treat the patient with a drug, the tumor responds to having that drug working on it by evolving into or changing, mutating into a, in, into a different uh, form. And you can overcome that with drug combinations, for example, to, to, to decrease the number of opportunities that the cancer cell has for getting around the, getting around the drug. So we need to expand the cancer genome, the druggable cancer genome, and we need to find ways to overcome resistance. I would say those are the two most biggest challenges. And finally, we need to understand why some patients respond to immunotherapy and other patients don't. We really have a poor understanding of, of that. I think attracting young scientists into translational research is, 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 first of all, it's really important. I think what I would say to, for example, the young researchers that I spoke to here this morning, um, fantastic group of students and, and postdocs, is first of all, it's a really exciting area. So um, the science is exciting, you know, the intellectual challenge, the scientific challenge, the technical challenge is is really exciting. The tools that we have to solve the problems now, like the new technologies for making drugs, for designing drugs, uh, CRISPR technology for validating targets, um, new immunotherapies and so on, the, the science and the technology is moving so fast and it's very exciting. Also, it, I think it's motivating because you can really make a difference if you work in a multidisciplinary project team which is also exciting. It's really exciting to work with scientists who have a different perspective and a different technical background to yourself. So I love working with chemists. I'm a biologist, but I love working with chemists. I love working with clinicians and engineers and different types of researchers. Uh, and by working in these multidisciplinary project teams, you can achieve incredible things. You know, we've got s multiple drugs into the clinic. I could never have achieved that just in my own lab. But by working across team, also by working with scientists in industry as well as in academia. So there's opportunities in industry as well as in academia. You can form a biotech company and learn about how to you know, develop uh, new therapies in, in that way. So it's intellectually exciting. It's technically moving really fast. It's rewarding because you can benefit patients and... and uh, and you learn a lot from working in translational research with, with. So I think probably it would be the, the work that led to the drug called Capivacertib. This is the AKT inhibitor that's currently under review by the FDA. So this is a very exciting time. Um, we had previously worked in the same pathway on uh, a target called PI3 kinase, and we had been successful, and we got drugs into the clinic. But in the end, the side effects of the drug, even though they were very effective, the side effects were meant that it was they couldn't be taken forward any further. Although some follow-up drugs of the same type eventually were approved for for patient use. So when we decided to take on AKT, it was the, if you like, it was the next protein down in the pathway that we wanted to to block. And we worked very closely with Aztecs Therapeutics and very quickly using this fragment-based approach, structure-based design based on the crystal structure, 3D structure of the protein. We very quickly got to prototype drugs and showed proof of concept in, in an animal model. And then we partnered with AstraZeneca and AstraZeneca helped to complete the project and then funded the clinical trials. So that was that was fantastically exciting technically um, and then the drug has gone into the clinic and has already in the trials so far has increased has doubled the time before the tumor comes back in patients with a with an advanced form of breast cancer so doubling the the um, progression free survival so we hope that that will be approved so i think that's been probably overall the most exciting and rewarding and of, of course it's 
it's the current one that we're waiting for a decision for approval. So it's very much at the front of my, my mind and we're hoping that patients will you know, get the opportunity to benefit from that drug. I'm really happy to be invited to this, um, privileged you know, to be invited to, to celebrate with the team here. They've done fantastic work over five decades. Um, in the UK, we called it the golden anniversary. If it's a wedding anniversary, you say it's the golden, golden wedding anniversary. So I said in my lecture, you know, I'm, I'm here to celebrate your gold anniversary. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing another 50 years of, you know, fantastic success. I've really enjoyed meeting the researchers here. I already knew many of them. It's great to meet the young, young scientists here. They've been so helpful and uh, motivated organ and chairing the sessions. And, and so, so you can see there's, there's a very strong group of scientists here who are well-trained. It's well-funded. There's good core facilities. Um, it's an excellent institute. And it fits very well into the French ecosystem and the international system. And um, it's a privilege to be here, and I wish them every success in the future. <laughs>